Dr. Parul Dhamin Mukherjee will be lecturing on rethinking the comparative aesthetics in uneven globalizing times. Dr. Mukherjee proposes to rethink the methodology of comparative aesthetics and reflect on the shifts that have affected this field since its early inception in newly post-colonial India in mid-20th century. Significantly, it was in the 1950s that the comparative aesthetics enjoyed popularity in newly colonized India as a field that was expected to bring to the light an alternative knowledge system that the West had overlooked in its desire to colonize. There is a resurgence of comparative aesthetics in more recent globalized times, but stakes have changed remarkably. Aesthetics, once overshadowed by the cultural studies, turn has once again begun to enter the center stage of many disciplines. Perhaps the time for the post-colonial critic of Eurocentric aesthetics is over. However, the current global time is not a post-colonial movement as the field of the study is still not level playing. A more formidable task awaits researchers in the global south of writing critical histories and carrying out rigorous archival research, not in isolation but in critical conversation with the discursive frameworks of global north. While comparativism seems to be an inescapable condition of our globalizing world where different cultures are thrown together, it is equally imperative not to, uh, not to valorize it as a given method but question the terms and tools of the comparison and explore the asymmetries that inform the film. Dr. Mukherjee is Professor in Visual Studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, India. She holds a PhD in Entology from Oxford University. Her research interests include global art history, comparative Asian art, and comparative aesthetics. I request Dr. Mukherjee to begin the public lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Snehal, for the introduction. And uh, I thank you all for coming to listen to this talk uh, and braving this terrible weather uh, on Saturday afternoon. I really appreciate this. Um, and also, what I have to talk about is going to be, I don't know whether it will be dry, but it's really not about uh, the exciting feel of contemporary art, but it's really about sets of methodological problems, um, which at least interest me a great deal. And I hope at the end we can have interesting discussion, Q and I, a Q&A between uh, you and me. Just brief introduction to this uh, topic, rethinking comparative aesthetics in uneven globalizing times. Uh, it's really something which uh, concerns me at the moment, my own research. Um, and I'm going to start with a polemical question, hmm? which is, what does comparative aesthetics as a method methodology offer to a contemporary present? Is it really relevant to our times? Um, so much of the polemics is born by the pronoun, um, as you can see, by the pronoun our contemporary present um, in this opening question. Do we have a common present in which we can discuss our common methodological problem? If we historicize this question of comparative aesthetics, then we lose the sense of the common, at least as far as the historiography of comparative aesthetics is concerned. The presentation is in two parts. So this is what I mean by laying so much of stress on the term our and the sense of the common. Uh, the talk is going to be in three broad parts. Uh, first is I'm going to just give you a short historiography of comparative aesthetics as it emerged in India and um, what it means today for our current times, how do we problematize it. Second is a kind of a terminological comparison between Anukriti, which is I think a very important and salient uh, conceptual frame which is very much part of Indian aesthetics, sadly neglected for various reasons and a much more commonly understood term, mimesis. And I would also like to draw your attention to uh, the politics of translation or representation by the difference 
uh, between the term Anukriti, which you always come across as it's italicized, whereas my missus is never italicized, because it's part, very much part of our normal understanding of representation. This is part of what I'm going to talk about, the unevenness of the discourse. And last is exactly the question of the uneven discourse of comparative aesthetics. So uh, section uh, part one, which is on historiography of comparative aesthetics. Uh, comparative aesthetics in India, it has its roots in the post-colonial uh, movement of the in the 1950s when compar comparing aesthetic concepts and practices of different cultures, it was very much the done thing and it seemed to resonate with the aspirations of a new nation and its cultural sovereignty. It was almost as if, okay, fine, now that we are you know, politically, culturally free of colonial, uh, you know, rule, we can be much more self-reflexive and have a certain autonomous understanding of aesthetics and that was a kind of euphoria which surrounded this particular moment. Now, in the wake of globalization, which is where we are right now, of decreasing distance between cultures and the gradual erosion of the nation state, World literature and world art studies are emerging as new areas of research and inquiry within which I would place comparative aesthetics. So in a sense, comparative aesthetics within this broader framework receives a certain kind of uh, energy or impetus. The comparative aesthetics moment of uh, mid-1920s was in a sense driven by a different agenda. Hmm? Because back then, uh, in 1950s, comparative aesthetics enjoyed popularity in the newly decolonized India as a field that was expected to bring to light an alternative knowledge system that the West had overlooked in its desire to colonize the world. But after a decade and a half, that euphoria was over and as far as the, uh, the discourse around comparative aesthetics was concerned, it could not extricate itself from the Eurocentric notions of representation such as naturalism, catharsis, and so on. So you had uh, very many important uh, Indian aestheticians like K.C. Pandey, P.J. Choudhury, Ramendra Kumar, who still somewhere would invoke the whole co colonial legacy of some of these terms, which also made their theorizing a bit defensive. However, the reinvention of comparative aesthetics in the present seems to follow in the wake of comparative literature. And it is comparative literature which has now become kind of exemplary in the way in which, in which it has uh, recently reinvented itself to be relevant to our times. I think uh, Jadhapur University, those of you are familiar with uh, this comparative literature, Jadhapur University has really been at the forefront in uh, you know, teaching courses, inspiring young students to take up topics for research and so on within comparative literature. Now, moving beyond the cultural politics of Cold War hostility um, between the West and the rest, where the latter was subsumed under area studies, comparative literature offered a new model of hospitality drawn from the former interaction across European literary cultures. And here, of course, I'm drawing a lot from Gadis Rivak's excellent uh, book, Death of a Discipline, which came out way back in uh, 2003 where she basically is trying to uh, tell us that uh, she touches upon a very important question of discipline formation and it's, it's a highly political question. The uh, question that she raises is what is the connection between uh, the geopolitics of the time and the emergence of new disciplines? Of course there's a connection and within that she talks about two frames which are kind of related but separate. One is she looks at the rise of combative literature in the first quarter of the 20th century which was largely a European phenomenon uh, where the idea was that um, the uh, lot of you know those who are working on literature were looking at ways of understanding uh, or rather creating inter European uh, cultural relationship through the model of hospitality. Remember, we are talking about whole generations of Africa by the First World War. So the idea of 
great of healing the schism divide between different European countries was a very important cultural project within which the first uh, kind of competitive literature emerged. However, when we talk about the rise of area studies, which is very much uh, important uh, discipline formation in the US, very closely related with Cold War cultural politics, where uh, the countries which were directly related with American uh, policy, uh, uh, foreign policy, where they also came under the realm of scholarly studies. So you suddenly you had new appointments, new funding available for uh, you know, uh, researchers, professors to completely at, uh, focus on Korean language, uh, Japanese language, so many different Asian languages, because they were also interested in those regions in terms of its geopolitics. So very close relationship between uh, rise of disciplines and the cultural politics. Today, this notion uh, that is, you know, in terms of inter-regional cooperation and so on, may seem to uh, appear precarious with UK's Brexit and Samuel Huntington's looming prophecy of clashing civilization, an ominous possibility in our world is threatened by violence, intolerance, religious fundamentalism. In this sense, I ask as a refrain, what does comparative aesthetics reshape, or how does comparative aesthetics reshape its concerns and disciplinary thinking to become relevant to our times? Now, in India, Comparative aesthetics opens up the question of politics of representation, especially in the current climate of rising fundamentalism. Under these conditions, the key question to be raised are, does Indian aesthetics only signal Sanskrit aesthetics? Under what conditions of knowledge production is there a formation of canon that is largely dominated by classical Sanskrit aesthetics in India? Is it valid to talk about tribal aesthetics that may lack the culture of uh, writing but may sustain a very vibrant art practice? Is this domination relational when we posit a larger frame of intercultural comparative aesthetics between Western and Indian aesthetics? Is comparative aesthetics possible only as an intercultural um, study across larger blocks of nation and civilizations like Indian, Chinese, European, African? How Indic is Indian aesthetics? Uh, for, for example, in medieval India, that witnessed new forms of Muslim patronage of art and culture, where Hindu artists and craftsmen catered to a Deccani or Mughal taste. Is there a place for Indo-Islamic aesthetics? Or can this be regarded as a site of cultural translation between, for example, classical Sanskrit aesthetics, uh, aesthetic concepts like Navarasa, and the Deccanese uh, Sultanate sensibility, uh, I'm referring to Adil Shah's seconds, Kitab and Navras, which really came up during, and there was intense interest in cultural translation, especially during that time, when so many Sanskrit texts were actually translated into Persian and vice versa. Can comparative aesthetics be performed between regional or Desi and classical or Margi aesthetics? How does Intra-comparativism. When I say intra-comparativism, I mean comparison, comparativism which is within, say, a cultural block. So, the distinction between Desi and Margi, would, within Indic context. How does that differ from intercomparativism? That is between Sanskrit and, say, Greek aesthetic theories, right? So, the distinction between intra and intercomparativism. How do we problematize comparativism itself as a method? when there prevails a vast asymmetry between the state of research, for example, in Greek or Western aesthetics and Sanskrit aesthetics. But this is something which I have always come across in my own research. The two fields are so uneven in terms of levels of research. In fact, in 1965, there was a special issue of the Journal of Art and Art Criticism which was entirely devoted to oriental aesthetics, mark the term oriental aesthetics, with contribution from leading experts from India like K.C. Pandey, P.J. Choudhury, to Ramendra Kumar and so on from India. And amongst the Western scholars you had Archie Baum, uh, Elliot Deutsch and Thomas Munro. And this was actually a very important moment which was meant to inaugurate a vibrant 
cross-cultural dialogue on aesthetics, just as it also gestured towards a certain unevenness of the field. Now, if we come back to today's time frame, there is a resurgence of comparative aesthetics in a more recent globalized times, but stakes have changed remarkably over the last four decades. Towards the end of 20th century, um, Oxford University Press brought out an encyclopedia of aesthetics, which was edited by Michael Kelly. Uh, and if you open it, the first entry itself is devoted to the Kashmiri aesthetician Abhinava Gupta. So it's quite interesting. Uh, aesthetics, once overshadowed by cultural studies, uh, once again began to enter the center stage of many disciplines and understood as deeply implicated with politics. So it's unfortunate that for a long time, um, since from the 1990s, when that was a time of the turn towards cultural studies, study of aesthetics really received a setback because if you follow the the cultural pol politics uh, model of cultural studies, then aesthetics was seen as a very elitist term. So it was not to be taken uh, you know, as something which is democratic enough. It was not politically correct to talk about aesthetics as something which really concerns us. So there was a kind of a setback, which later on you realize that this was handled better because uh, aesthetics was also seen as not just apolitical, but deeply implicated in politics. Uh, uh, Jean Rossier's uh, very famous book, Political Aesthetics, precisely demonstrated how the two you know, sides actually intersect. And there's nothing more political than the question of vision. And without vision, we can't talk about aesthetics. What we see, what we are allowed to see, uh, is a hugely political question. We don't see everything when we walk down the road. There are certain sites which we are habituated to seeing, but there are so many other sites we rather not see. right? Um, while comparativism seems to be an in, inescapable condition of a globalizing world where different cultures are thrown together, and I'm using a term from Hans Belting's post-historical times, that's the time which we are supposedly belonging to, it also witnesses a perpetual crisscrossing of the past and the present. It is equally imperative not to valorize comparativism as a given method but question the terms and tools of comparison and explore asymmetries that comparatism is deeply steeped in. I also see my research to be informed by a pedagogic concern for teaching comparative aesthetics today in India and elsewhere and the problems that it poses given the ascendancy of the right-wing government and its intrusion into academic life. And of course, I'm speaking from my own experience of teaching in JNU. The trace of development of my own interest in comparative aesthetics in 2001, or broadly to the turn of 21st century. So in 2001, when I first became a member of International Association of Aesthetics, after my paper presentation at a conference in Tokyo, I was at that time largely driven by the post-colonial discourse and used comparative aesthetics as a space to critique Eurocentricism, underlying the very discipline of aesthetics. Now, going beyond the critique and being made aware of the charge of derivative discourse through post-colonialism, I was drawn to a close textual study of some of the leading Indian theorists of aesthetics from 9th to 10th century of Christian, Christian era, Ananda Vardhana, Abhinava Gupta, for instance. Now, reading through this profoundly discursive text was both rewarding and, to some extent, alarming. While they are rich in their engagement with the issues of representation, aesthetics, and so on, but at times they're also problematic when you're looking, at, when you're reading it through the lens of gender. As a modern reader trained in Western intellectual discourse, with feminism being part of it, I could not dis uh, ignore the discomfort uh, with the implications of indigenous patriarchy. So you cannot set aside, you know, how uh, the way, uh, ways in which certain patriarchal values always intrude into the, uh, the, the theorization. Now, more recently, I have been involved uh, in debates with my colleagues about the relevance of pre-modern aesthetics in contemporary times. Indian academia today, I don't know about Bombay, but I, the, from my own experience of teaching in Delhi, is getting increasingly polarized between the left-oriented cosmopolitanism and right-oriented nativism. In such an environment, Interest in Sanskrit text is seen as aggressive 
and an acquiescence to the right-wing politics? What does it mean to carry out research in comparative aesthetics today when the cultural politics of our times is deeply polarized between the left and the right, between the vernacular and the elite cultures? Precisely to thwart such easy categorization, Professor Arun Mishra and I co-convened a national conference on comparative aesthetics through a con uh, contemporary frame uh, at the uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla just last November. The papers and discussion made us acutely aware of how loaded the term aesthetics is, even today. For example, the question of translation has not been settled. How do you translate aesthetics? Is it Sandhari Shastra? Well, Sandhari Shastra literally means study of the beautiful. It does not really capture the broad scope of aesthetics. Or could it be translated as Nandan Kala? Literally it means arts that give pleasure. So of course, at this very point, we are dealing with the problematics of translation. <clears throat> this question of translation is not just a linguistic problem, but is salient to the way in which disciplinary domains are carved out. Um, well, to some extent, I would say that absence of a term does not imply absence of a concept. For example, to some Western aestheticians and art historians like Frederick Asher, uh, the fact that there's not a one-to-one -one translation or correspondence between the term aesthetics and a native term from Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, or any other regional language makes them doubt if concepts of aesthetics had any relevance in the Indian context. Or was it just an artificial invention by modern Indians to redress the feeling of cultural inferiority? Does the absence of a term imply an absence of a concept? Those familiar with the very sophisticated discourse around aesthetics that appear predominantly in, in dramaturgy and literary poetics, well versed with what Bharata had to say in Natya Shastra, what Abhinava Gupta had to say about aesthetics, will return the gaze back to the West with acute derision. Because that level of complexity is really, uh, it's, it's absolutely staggering. As a corrective to this error, or I would say the serendipity of personal names, the uncommon logic of, uh, of a dictionary. You know, ancient India invented thesaurus, Amarakosha, but it did not in invent a dictionary. It is significant that the very first entry of the four volumes on aesthetics by Michael Kelly had been devoted to uh, Abhinavagupta. And that's what I mean by serendipity of personal names. It is a happy accident. In a sense, such del deliberations brought out aesthetics at the level of interculturalism. When you say interculturalism, we usually talk about the East-West uh, divide, as well as intraculturalism. Within the same cultural block, relationship between elite, popular, and vernacular. Are our inquiries always to be steeped into differentials of cultural specificity, or is there a scope for a possible universalist fame? At times, the world of nature, whichever way it is theorized, seems to offer this horizon. Whether you read Kant, Bharitrehari, Hegel, Anandavardhana, it's very interesting how each one of them, at some point, would you know, draw from the realm of culture. Uh, they talk about examples of flowers, bees, fruits, flowers, and in, they would use that as a way of talking about most profound aesthetic concepts. Is comparativism as a method uh, something created primarily by Western aestheticians or, and hence to be applied as an etic framework? When I say etic, I mean that which is uh, as a conceptual framework which is put together elsewhere, say in the Western context, and then it is applied to another culture from outside. Or can it be emic? By emic, I mean that which is internal to that culture that you are studying. So for example, if you look at uh, all these ancient, uh, uh, ancient Sanskrit texts on aesthetics, invariably you find terms like Margi, classical versus Desi, then Natya Dharmi versus Loka Dharmi. Natya Dharmi would be that which is stylized, convention bound, as opposed to Loka Dharmi, which is natural, literally which is found in the world, or the realm of Vrishya, the realm of visible, versus the realm of Shavya, of what you hear. So, so in fact, these I would consider as the emic uh, 
terms of comparison, which had already given in the, in the, in the tradition. <clears throat> Does a comparison between Western and Indian aesthetics stem from a desire to exoticize the culturally unfamiliar or a nativist desire to valorize Indian aesthetics? Does the study of aesthetics expand its border to accommodate its others, like the folk, the tribal, the performative, the sultanate, the Mughal, and so on? Does aesthetics privilege the visual, or could it also include within its realm the uh, registers of touch, smell, hearing? Okay. I think I'll just move on here, 19. However, if you revisit methodological questions, what is clear to me is that the time for post-colonial critique of Eurocentric aesthetics is over. I think we've done enough of that. At the same time, the current global era is not a post-post-colonial moment, as the field of study is not some level playing, is not at all level playing at the moment, and vast asymmetries still abound the field. A more for formidable task which awaits researchers in Global South of writing critical histories and carrying out rigorous archival research. But these histories cannot be created without an engagement with the discursive framework and resources of the Global North. And so I think it's very, very important not to fall into a kind of an isolationist model. That, you know, we don't need anything. We can just, we are resources are already available and we just work within the culture. Comparative aesthetics in the Global South when I say global south, I just not only mean South Asia, Asia, but I also mean uh, you know Latin America and and, uh, and so on. Um, so comparative aesthetics in the global south has to also be wary of lapsing into a defensive addition to the theories of Western aesthetics. So if the West had a long history of tragedy, my message, so even we had the same. Such a reactionary approach at best yields a patchwork coverage of non-Western sources, which often end up being footnote to the established theories of Western aesthetics. This is going to happen, bound to happen, in the absence of larger discursive comparative framework. We move to the second part. Before we move to the second part, I just want you to look at some of these, uh, uh, according to me, brilliant uh, you know, examples of ancient art. This is just a detail from cave number one, Ajanta mural. And it's this, in terms of its drawing, it, this image is so exquisite. Uh, I just want to point out uh, certain details to you. That is, look at the ways in which a sense of dimensionality has been created. The artist, we don't know what the artist hmm? Would be a Buddhist monk, we don't know in order to create a sense of roundness. I mean, do you agree that there's an enormous plasticity to this image? There's a sense of depth, dimensionality. It has been created not by using any cross hatchings, which we normally come across in a lot of Western art, like post and Western art. It's been created by very interesting alternative means. Of course, in terms of its sinuous contour lines, mark the way in which the roundness of bangle it is so cleverly used in order to emphasize the roundness of the arm. Hmm? So these are kind of, uh, you know, stylistic or representation strategies out of which this kind of dimensionality can be created. And at the same time, I also want you to notice that the fact that this figure almost seems to protrude as a dimensionality, it seems to protrude into our space, the artists were not very happy about the fallout of this, this uh, way of showing images because the chances are that empty spaces will be seen as deep spaces. And at that point, it's not aesthetically appealing. So, very interestingly, you find there are these little floral motifs which are strewn so that our attention will come back to the frame, come back to the surface. And so, these artists they precisely knew what they were doing with a very clear aesthetic. Sensibility. <clears throat> and some more images I wanted to show you. Oh, I'm sorry, the slide is not very good. But recently, uh, Ajanta is undergoing restoration, Ajanta Caves. And some of the caves have been so beautifully restored. 
uh, there was some, uh, you know, there was this disastrous attempt at restoration by some Italian restorers in early 20th century. They had ended up damaging the paintings because they used some wrong chemicals. But uh, the recent restoration has actually been able to get rid of that layer and to some extent the orig original uh, layer has been restored and uh, apparently the, the sense of naturalism is so vivid that people have been startled by what they've seen so far. This is not a very uh, clear slide, but it gives you a sense of, uh, you know, the, the confidence with which, you know, this kind of representation was handled. Okay, so now I'm going to come to the second section, which is, it's going to be called a detour into terminological comparison between Anukriti and Mimesis. Of course, this, uh, this slide I'm calling it Anukriti now. Why are we looking at Anukriti now? A term which was there in 8th and 9th century, um, you know, present in various commentaries related with uh, aesthetics. But why are we trying to uh, engage with it now? Situated in the, at the beginning, in the beginning of the second decade of 21st century, what is my urgency to invoke a discourse on Anukriti that arose between 10th and 11th century uh, CE in India? Now, contemporary theory of representation that has long questioned the binary opposition between copy and the original, the analog and the digital, in the post-industrial and technolog technologized present, and it is no longer possible to maintain a distinction between the natural and the man-made in post-human world. Now, naturalism, uh, within quotes, a category of resemblance, once the hallmark of Western control over representation in colonial times, has itself come under rigorous, rigorous philosophical interrogation from Walter Benjamin, Richard Walheim, Nelson Goodman, Michael Tosik, Jacques Derrida, uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze, they have all, you know, contested that uh, that like you know state notions about naturalism while in the western context there's a, there's been a rich problematic uh, along a broad spectrum of you know between iconic and symbolic modes of representation so most recent work is of course by um, somebody called matthew uh, potolsky who's written a book on just on mimesis which came out in 2006 According to me, an equally nuanced debate that set up different positions around representation in the Indian context, it actually also existed. It has not been, I think, explored uh, adequately. A closer attention to this text in terms of his repressed theory of mimesis would counter the contemporary Western theorization of mimesis as a domain that had no meaning outside the West. Okay, so I just want you to pay attention to this quote uh, from uh, the author I was talking about, uh, Matthew Potolsky, where he says, uh, few cultures outside the West have regarded realism as an important goal. Many traditional cultures, moreover, do not make the sharp distinction between art and reality that Western theory has inherited from Plato. Art in these cultures, which includes uh, India, in these cultures is closely intertwined with ritual and with daily life, much as it seems to have been in archaic Greek culture before Plato's intervention. Without the presumed difference of art from reality that underwrites Plato's critique of mimesis, the idea of realism of reproducing life in different medium has little meaning. Understand outside the West. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm deeply, I find uh, this assertion deeply problematic because Potolsky's ethnologizing of traditional culture that lacks the critical distance to speculate on the difference between image and reality because, you know, the ancient Indians oh, were too immersed in ritual, daily life, is hardly applicable to the discursive framework of Abhinava Bharti. At a time, I'm talking about 9th and 10th century um, AD, at a time when neither technology nor media in the modern sense shaped thinking, how did these early theoreticians and philosophers arrive at problematization of representation and the status of the real in painting and drama? Anybody who fo uh, follows the debate which is there in the commentaries of Abhinava Gupta in Abhinava Bharti on Natya Shastra, 
you will realize that the debate unfolds at a high level of intellectual sophistication among many positions that can be easily divided between the supporters and critics of my message. So there were these two camps and they were arguing with each other whether it is relevant or whether it's not relevant. While it has been speculated that around 5th century uh, BCE, in ancient Greece, Plato made a foundational distinction between image and reality, which was to leave a lasting impact on long intellectual tradition that unfolded in the West. I will posit that a similar awareness of distinction between image and reality existed in India, but its history and genealogy in Indian philosophy, and especially in epistemology, theory of knowledge, is, is hardly explored to that extent, and its relevance for our practice and our theory has been not properly examined. Many comparative attempts have been made between Greek art theory and ancient Indian art uh, one. Sorry, oops. Hmm. They have been made, but the preconceived notions about Anukriti, for example, have blocked the way for sustained comparison. Now, I'm just going to touch upon this uh, problem of translatability, which I do not see as, as a problem. It can be turned into a heuristic, which is a potential for asking important research questions. Now, of course, Anukriti and Anukaran, that cannot be ever translated into mimesis and mimicry. It's not, they are not the same. So how about uh, you know, mixing up terms in terms of coining new terms, which actually have a sense of both, like you know, mimicry, Anukriti, and so on. So when I had presented this paper uh, at Florence a month and a half back, so it was quite interesting the Western audience, the moment they looked at the term anuk anukrisis, they said, oh yes, crisis, we understand the term now. Because they're so used to being, uh, you know, uh, used to dealing with the term crisis. And see, they see this as crisis in translation. <coughs> okay, so this is just a playful way of dealing with uh, questions of translation. Now, I come to this very, very problematic issue, which is, uh, does, it, does it mean that we have to search for a native theory? Um, you know, usually, uh, this problem is related with the question of interpretive crisis in art history, which is very much affecting uh, the, the, the discipline today, and that is the feeling that um, usually whenever we do art historical analysis, for example, we always tend to use familiar methodology from the Western context, the way we've understood it in terms of stylistic analysis, formalism, social history, and so on. And but now that we've already uh, been talking about post-colonial turn in art history and so on, very often Western scholars, they turn the tables back at us and they say, well, don't you think it's about time that you also started having your own, uh, you know, you, you can turn to your own intellectual tradition and come up with theoretical frameworks which we, for a change, can also use? Of course, it's huge, hugely, you know, this whole question is hugely contested because one has to quickly remind them that 200 years of colonization can just, cannot just be overlooked. And there's no some pristine past which is waiting to be unearthed. You know, so uh, it, it really kind of uh, creates a very challenging situation for those who are interested in exploring alternative interpretative tradition. Now we come to the, the third section which is the last section, uh, which I have called it the uneven discourse of comparative aesthetics. And I, have, I want to start with uh, this quotation from R. Radhakrishnan, uh, which is in the, from this book, Theory in an Uneven World. It is the ability of the developed world to conceptualize and theorize its particular organic empirical reality into cognitive epistemic formula on behalf of the entire world that poses a dire threat to other knowledges. It's a